This video has been a long time coming. Anyone who follows the gender conflict as part of the overarching culture wars knew it would only be a matter of time before J.K. Rowling, a beloved children's author and creator of one of the largest multimedia franchises of our time, would face the same fate as so many others beforehand, and that is with daring to challenge an orthodoxy which has risen without question over the last few years. Now, Rowling herself is no stranger to this conflict, of course. She's previously faced stern criticism for liking Twitter posts deemed toxic, or following individuals guilty of wrong think. During this time, however, she generally didn't air her own views. Rather, she just shared views of other people, and was fairly quick to back off when the flack became too great. But something has changed over the last month or so, and Rowling, for one reason or another, has decided to let her views known on one particular subject, that of menstruators, or, or women, whichever you prefer. In a tweet sent on the 6th of June, sharing an opinion piece from devx.com on periods, Rowling questioned the usage of the term menstruator, saying, people who menstruate? I'm sure there used to be a word for those people. Someone help me out. Wumben? Wimpund? Woo-mud? It doesn't seem like anyone actually came out to help Rowling's conundrum. Instead, this short paragraph caused more controversy than any of the times she announced a Harry Potter character was secretly gay. Angry Twitter threads were composed, celebrities added further virtue signals to their widening belts, and of course the progressive press, hyped up following the BLM riots we've been seeing unfolding over the last few weeks, were quick to jump on board. Following this, Rowling uploaded an article onto her personal blog with a rather catchy title, J.K. Rowling writes about her reasons for speaking out on sex and gender issues. Neat. The piece was quite lengthy and the most vocal Rowling has ever been on the gender debate, but this response did her no favours with the gender activists and Rowling was once again savaged by the press, former Harry Potter actors and even the body shop for some reason. So how did it all come to this? Is Rowling a hate-filled transphobic bigot? Or are her views being misrepresented amidst an already heated debate? Rowling's history within the queer community has always been checkered, despite the popularity of the Harry Potter series within those circles. This has mostly taken the form of Rowling retcomming the sexuality of Professor Dumbledore, making him canonically gay, and this left queer fans annoyed that the sexuality was never raised within the books, and treated as a token gesture rather than anything meaningful. And this was exhilarated when Rowling hinted Dumbledore's relationship with another gay character, Grindelwald, would be central to one of the Fantastic Beasts films, only for it to never transpire. Rowling's also featured a trans character in the second book of her crime series, Comoran Strike, which is written under the pen name Robert Galbraith. In Silkworm, published in 2014, a murder suspect called Pippa Midley is revealed to be a trans woman, leaving the main character to immediately notice her Adam's apple. He then makes a remark on having her sent to jail for his attempted murder, saying, It won't be fun for you inside, Pippa. Not pre op. A friend of the protagonist is horrified by this threat and sharply chides him for making it. Pripper is eventually revealed to be innocent and plays a key role in catching the murderer, but it should be noted that Pippa always retains female pronouns even after her history is revealed. Now, as I previously mentioned, Rowling is no stranger to the trans debate, although her views were mostly expressed in liking or sharing posts made by other people. The earliest sign of her gender critical views came in March 2018, where she liked a tweet written by a Labour Party activist. The message said, I was shouted at by men at my first Labour Party meeting aged 18 because I asked them to remove a page free calendar. I've been told to toughen up, be louder, stronger, independent. I've often not felt supported. Men in dresses get brochalist solidarity I never had. That's misogyny. News quickly spread that Rowling liked this tweet, causing a wave of outrage, but one of her representatives tried to play down the matter, telling Pink News, I'm afraid JK Rowling had a clumsy and middle-aged moment, and this is not the first time she has favourited by holding her phone incorrectly. The matter eventually died down, only for it to reignite more than a year later when a group called Trans Advocate found Rowling followed a gender-critical feminist named Magdalene Burns. Burns had made several controversial comments on trans people in the past, including one claiming trans women were blackface actors who get sexual kicks from being treated like women. Now, following Burns' account led to claims Rowling was secretly transphobic, and her representatives declined to comment on this occasion. 
and the claims for transphobia grew further when Rowling supported Maya Forstater, a gender-critical woman who took the Centre for Global Development to an employment tribunal after her contract wasn't renewed for expressing her opinions on trans issues. The judge rejected Forstater's case, claiming her views on trans women weren't worthy of respect in a democratic society. Along with the hashtag, I stand with Maya, Rowling tweeted, dress however you please, call yourself whatever you like, sleep with any consenting adult who will have you live your best life in peace and security, but force women out of their job for stating that sex is real? Once again, the outrage came. Now, last month, after being silent for a while, Rowling came under fire yet again for liking a tweet. This time, it was one discussing trans activist Alex Drummond, who's famous for keeping a beard as a way of widening the bandwidth on how to be a woman. The tweet referred to Drummond as a man who considered lesbians who don't like penises as being transphobic. It was also noted that Rowling liked another tweet that said humans only come in two immutable sexes. And in a further tweet discussing her latest book, The Ichabog, Rowling accidentally pasted some text relating to trans activist Tara Wolf to an unsuspecting fan. Now, each tweet liked or shared brought Rowling more and more disdain from the trans community, and her post on menstruators appeared to be the final straw. Rowling could no longer hide from the outrage, and she needed to hit it head on. So let's take a look at Rowling's response and see if we can answer the question. Does JK Rowling, beloved author of the Harry Potter books, hate trans people? Rowling's essay is lengthy, so it wouldn't be productive to go over it word for word, so instead, I'm going to summarise her arguments as follows. Rowling explained her interest in the trans debate started more than two years ago, when she began to follow the debate around gender identity. She said she'd met trans people and read books and blogs by trans people, as well as gender specialists, intersex people, psychologists, social workers and doctors. She referenced her crime series as a reason she was looking into this as a professional, saying one of her characters would be directly impacted by this debate. She highlights the vicious comments she's received as a result of liking tweets of following gender critical voices including Magdalene Burns. In particular, she states she was told she was literally killing trans people with her hate. She also mentions she received an avalanche of supportive comments, including from those who deal with gender dysphoria as a professional, saying they're worried about the erosion of rights for women and girls. She mentions she's been labelled as a TERF, highlights examples including a mother of a gay child who was afraid they wanted to transition to escape bullying, and MS's policy for allowing those who identify as women into female changing rooms. She also says radical feminists aren't trans exclusionary as they include trans men in their feminism due to biology. She then mentions five reasons for being worried about trans activism. The first is that she believes trans activism is having an impact on a number of causes she supports, including female survivors of domestic and sexual abuse, along with research into MS. The second is that she is an ex-teacher, so has concerns about safeguarding and the trans rights movement's impact on this. Thirdly, she supports free speech, even for Donald Trump, apparently. Fourth, that she's concerned with the number of people wishing to transition, mentioning detransitioning rates and rapid onset gender dysphoria. Finally, her fifth concern is she's worried about the consequences of trans activism. She clarifies that she wants trans women to be safe, but also doesn't wish to make women and girls less safe. So does having concern with any of these topics really make one transphobic? It's really hard to argue that they do. A movement that has only recently hit the mainstream in the last decade or so brings with it a radical shake-up of the status quo, and so it's important to discuss what that might entail. But the concerns from trans activists, however, appear to be reading between the lines. Jacob Tobiah, a self-described trans-Arab socialist spunky girl, claimed Rowling was asserting that trans women aren't real women, and pointed to what they perceive as a gender-critical belief that trans women seek to mislead people. Tobiah compared this with the violence from men who might kill a trans woman for tricking them, declaring that JK Rowling has blood on her hands for this very reason. 
I've discussed the murder statistics of trans people in the past, but as a short summary, despite being told we live in an epidemic of trans murders, the worldwide numbers don't back that up. According to a group called Trans Respect vs Transphobia, 331 trans people were murdered between October 2018 and September 2019. Of those figures, the vast majority of killings take place in South America. The USA has the most murders of trans people in the developed world, but the motives aren't always established. Instead, activists will often declare that the murder is transphobia when there could be other more overriding factors at play, which can include muggings or even being the victim of a mass shooting. Whether Tobias is aware of or acknowledges this is unclear, but either way, the accusation that Rowling, or indeed any gender-critical feminist, has blood on their hands or are somehow responsible for any trans murders is alarmist and irresponsible. I would add that I've encountered the argument from some on the gender-critical side that trans women seek to trick people into believing they are the opposite sex and I agree that is a nasty theory as it implies that trans people are scheming manipulators but again there's no evidence to suggest that this has led to any killings or violence. Another argument brought up against Rowling is that of discussing biological sex. As an example, here's an article by Katie Montgomery, an LGBT advocate, who explains that trans people fully acknowledge biological sex, although ends her piece by mentioning that sex is more complicated than simply having XY or XX chromosomes. Now, it's fair to say the vast majority of trans people accept biological sex as real, as it's certainly a commonly held fact within the majority of trans people I personally know. After all, if a trans woman was biologically female, why would she need to transition? Why would she need to take medication to have surgeries? But but this view is not shared by all within the community. In January 2017, Riley Dennis, a prominent trans YouTuber, made a video on how trans women are not biologically male, claiming that sex is a social construct just like gender. And in a recent article for The Independent, queer drag queen Glamroo claims the idea of biological sex stems from the British Empire and ideas of white supremacy, saying the British Age of Enlightenment prized itself on scientific rationality, including with it strict taxonomies of racial and sex categorization i.e. your biology meant you were strictly male or female, and there was a rigid hierarchy of racial superiority, with whites at the top. And so, Britain's cannibalisation of the rest of the globe simultaneously enraged rich non-Western trans histories. A post from the website Growing Up Transgender entitled Biological Sex as a Social Construct is one of the first results which appears in a Google search on the subject, and it's a phrase that's being parroted by supposed allies to the trans cause, such as George Takai. Narratives such as this don't come out of nowhere. The queer community regularly fosters extreme and bizarre narratives with little internal pushback, and the idea that biological sex isn't real, that it is a concept brought about by imperialism, capitalism and the patriarchy, essentially the enemies of the radical left funnily enough, that it's somehow problematic is just the latest example. But the biological sex argument also becomes a Mott and Bailey argument. Now, that is an argument that can have different meanings, one very simple and defensible, and others that are quite extreme. Activists really support the extreme version when talking with allies, but retweat to the smaller, more easily defended argument when challenged. That is happening here, and it happens a lot in trans discussions. The Mott version of the argument is that sex is more than XX and XY chromosomes, and that is absolutely true. Any number of intersex conditions can mean those chromosomes end up with atypical results, but that's not what's being argued, because we aren't talking about intersex people who are male or female, but with a developmental disorder. We're talking about trans people who are fully functioning males or females who identify as a different sex. That is a completely different argument, not defensible and is using intersex people to push a trans narrative. This is an old problem that too many activists sadly turn a blind eye to. Another popular critique Rowling has faced from many within the trans community has to do with the demands to listen to trans voices. Now, Rowling can demonstrate that she has talked to and listened to trans people in the past. In her essay, she discusses a trans woman she knows who has transitioned later in life, using female pronouns for her and even stating she'd find it hard to think of her as anything other than a woman. Rowling also follows a number of trans people on Twitter, including Fionn Olander and Debbie Hayton, who she holds a lot of respect for. 
It's fair to acknowledge that both Fionn and Debbie fall on the more gender-critical side of the trans debate, but the statement that to listen to trans voices demands that she listens to trans voices, and that is exactly what she's done. But the real problem with the demand to listen to trans voices is that the demand in itself is always coded language, and you'll hear this from any movement associated with identity politics. The statement implies that speaking to anyone from the named group will give you a uniform answer on the concerns felt by the speaker, but this is never the case as it completely removes individual opinion. A Black Lives Matter activist, for example, might tell you to listen to black voices, but they aren't going to mean black people who disagree with their message, such as Candace Owens, Zuby, Dominique Samuels, or Inaya Oman. And it is exactly the same with trans people. Finally, the last criticism I want to address is that Rowling was using coded language. Effectively, this means the gender critical side is hiding their true feelings on trans people by focusing on discussions of biology or women's rights. In short, the gender critical side wishes to remove trans rights through the back door. Such assertions are hard to make hold water when looked through at a critical glance, although that doesn't mean it's not without merit. Rowling's essay mentions she's never once come across hatred for trans people through the gender critical community, but there's certainly a extreme elements in that movement, as with all identity movements, that do bear an extreme dislike for trans people. But it would be unfair to hold these extreme examples as evidence for the entire movement being founded on hate, by all means acknowledge it, but I find the claim that gender critical movement is founded on transphobia is as misleading as to claim that trans rights movement is based on misogyny and homophobia, which is an allegation which they often face from the gender critical community. There's certainly elements of hate within both, but doesn't mean that the entire movement on either side are entirely comprised of it. But the claim that gender critical activists are seeking to erase rights needs to answer one question. What rights are they wanting to take away? And more specifically to this video, what rights is JK Rowling proposing to take away? Whether something is a right or not is a deep topic, but social justice advocates are very quick to call things rights even when they don't meet that definition. They believe that if they declare something a right, you must give it to them. Just like if you don't agree with their identity, you are denying their right to exist. You may have heard trans activists protesting that their existence is denied. It's not. It's a discussion about labels and how to accurately describe people. If someone simply doesn't agree with the gender label you use, that may upset you. But it's not fatal. We need to have some perspective here. Rowling's argument is effectively that you can do what you want, but I get to have my opinion. We don't know whether Rowling wishes to ban all trans people from accessing female restrooms, for example. The argument on rights itself is complicated, and at no point does Rowling state she wishes for anything to be taken away. Now, to be charitable, I've no doubt there are opponents of trans rights who wish for legal protections to be taken away, but by reading too much into what the gender critical side is saying, trans activists are playing the boy who cried wolf, and are jumping the gun a bit too early on a situation which might not even play out in the way it does in their heads. Reading through Rowling's article, there's really very little in what she says that could be truly deemed hateful or harmful. That's not to say the piece is perfect. For example, Rowling asserts that radical feminists can't be trans exclusionary as they include trans men in their feminism, but doesn't acknowledge that many radfems do see trans men as lesbians who have been misled into transitioning. It's effectively the equivalent of someone saying they support gays getting married because they can marry a woman. Rowling's comment on how a man who intends to have no surgery nor hormones may obtain a gender recognition certificate is also a little bit misleading. It's true that undergoing medical procedures or receiving medication aren't essential to receiving the GRC. As stated on the government website, you need to be over 18, diagnosed with gender dysphoria, lived in a new gender for at least two years, and intend to live as such for the rest of your life. But someone living as a man would unlikely to meet the real life test requirements needed to obtain the GRC in the first place. It's unclear whether Rowling is referring to a man who wishes to circumvent the system to get a certificate, or if she's calling trans women men. But it's an important distinction to make. However, it's also important to ask whether this criticism of Rowling's understanding of the GRC procedures is dishonest. That's because 
with these critics who say biological sex isn't real, I think most of them don't think someone should have to take hormones or have surgery or even do anything to get a GRC. If all trans people are valid, isn't that end goal exactly what Rowling is criticising? JK Rowling, as far as empirical evidence is concerned, does not wish to take away the rights of trans people. She doesn't hate trans people. She simply holds an opposing view to a few of the radical trans narratives which have emerged over the last few years. Narratives which aren't even accepted by all trans people. And this disagreement, no matter how it is painted, is not transphobia. Now at this point, let's pull back and see what's happened. We don't know where Rowling falls on the specific, minute questions, but we do know there's someone who has trans friends and has used pronouns for their friends and is happy for them to live secure and fruitful lives is being bombarded with hate over potential linguistic arguments. All we know is that she disagrees with the term woman no longer being related to sex. That isn't a controversial position to take even a decade ago, and with many, it's not even controversial now. Rowling's worldview on trans issues would previously be considered progressive in the debate, and once would have been held up as an ally. So what does it say about this movement when someone still in the process of building their position are being bombarded with messages of hate, when acquaintances are being demanded to condemn her, or even large businesses wading in what was ultimately just a blog post of a woman expressing her views in a hotly contested subject. How do you think that makes one feel? Do you assume she's just going to be swayed by the righteous cancelling she's encountered, or the threats to her physical well-being, or the accusations that she is somehow responsible for people's deaths? Of course, the disownment everyone was waiting for came from the stars of the Harry Potter films, Emma Watson, Daniel Radcliffe and Rupert Grint. Now, Watson's condemnation was entirely predictable, as she is an outspoken intersectional feminist who has made many statements in support of the trans rights cause. But she would have at the very least looked into this subject enough before commenting, but Radcliffe and Grint? Well, not quite as likely. Have they read the works of Julia Serrano or Janice Raymond and come to their own conclusions? Is this a subject they've lived and breathed and formed a genuine passion in? Or are they just following a mob who they've seen viciously take down Rowling and would rather join it than be found guilty themselves? It should be noted that the high profile disownments never address any of the claims Rowling makes in her essay. They amount to nothing more than milk toast declarations of solidarity and the repeated mantra of trans women are women. Nothing particularly special, although Twitter saw fit to give Radcliffe his own emoji for bravely standing with the crowd. If anything, Radcliffe in particular is just likely repeating a statement already given to him by a group like the Trevor Product. How does Radcliffe explain how disagreeing with the phrase trans women or women erases dignity and identity? Or which particular advice from healthcare professions is he referring to? I don't think he has the answer to either of those questions, which should be concerning regardless of where you fall in this debate. And what's more, this further presents the idea that trans people have a level of uniformity on what is a heavily complex and divisive issue. Maybe they can answer a few more questions with their newfound trans advocate status. Can a non-transition trans woman be a women's representative? Should Karen White be in a women's jail? Will cis women lose out if trans women compete in the same sport? Should a part-time transvestite appear on a list celebrating the top 100 women in business? Do females have any rights to a space of their own with no reservations? And what about non-binary women? They only identify as partly women. Should they gain full access to women's spaces? These examples are extreme, and I understand that, but it highlights the complexity of the trans debate as all the aforementioned need to be considered. But in their rush to please the mob, Radcliffe and friends don't acknowledge the complexity of the subject they've decided to dive headfirst into. Watson's statement also calls much into question. Trans people are who they say they are, and deserve to live their lives without being constantly questioned or told they aren't who they say they are. Now, I've discussed my problem with the open border policy on trans issues many a time. The idea that self-ID is all that's needed to become something is amongst the most ludicrous demands made by gender radicals. But Watson's statement goes way beyond arguing for self-ID and instead is a complete refusal to have an opinion. You're a wizard, This Harry. is a woman because she says she's a woman. It reads like a desire to placate radicals, whatever it takes for her not to be cancelled. It also ignores entryism that identity groups, including trans groups, have used to request entry only to then demand a seat on the board. These actions disrupt communities and everyone should have a say in what goes on. 
Now, of course, the Harry Potter actors were far from the only celebrities to make statements of condemnation, taking time from their busy schedules of pushing Black Lives Matter to pursue other noble social justice causes, and most, if not all, fall into the same traps. Do they really know what they're talking about? Or, more likely, are they just fearful of the mob? Like Noma Dumasweni, who played Hermione on stage, and she deleted a tweet in support of JK Rowling because of backlash. JK Rowling wrote an essay detailing her thoughts on a hotly contested subject, and in turn she was vilified, any nuance removed and labelled a hateful extremist. It's become yet another defining moment in how intersectional and progressive narratives seek to make enemies out of reasonable individuals and place malice where there is none. Does she have more to learn about trans people? Probably, but the rage she has encountered is ultimately more harmful to the trans debate than anything she has ever written. JK Rowling did nothing wrong.